<coughs> so, um, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, so, we're waiting for the last ones to be seated here. You're not live. You're not on the light speaker. I, th I think I was. Yeah. So, welcome to this. Um, uh, topic of the quest for artificial general intelligence and the limits of science. And our guest here is uh, Professor John Lennox from Oxford University. And let me start by presenting him. So first we have to thank the artists at the, at the library for this wonderful uh, artistic dis depiction of the, of the topic here. And, uh, but um, uh, John Lennox is a professor emeritus of mathematics at the University of Oxford and an emeritus fellow in math and the philosophy of science at Green Templeton College, Oxford. And I will be interviewing him. I'm uh, Professor Svara Holm at the physics department here at the University of Oslo. And uh, let me just uh, present John a little bit first. So John has been working in mathematics and you know that uh, we have Niels Henrik Abel's house and we have uh, Sophus Lee Auditorium. And John has been working on abelian groups and, and Lie groups and Sulov groups, who was the third uh, mathematician uh, from, uh, from Oslo for 150 years ago, I think. So uh, that's your mathematical connection to Norway. <laughs> so, uh, but he's also uh, been uh, um, writing a lot of books. These are just a few of them, and there's a couple of them in Norwegian as well, been translated. And the, um, I'm, uh, yeah, and the topic here, of course, is from these two books, 2084, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Humanity, as well as Can Science Explain Everything? Now, um, we are going to open for questions uh, after the uh, 45 minutes or so, and we're going to use this uh, uh, Menti, uh, web application so you can you can scan the code or or type in the address and uh, and uh, ask questions there so I'm going to leave that open as we start here now so um, let me just uh, ask start asking you a question John first I'm very grateful <laughs> to be here with you but you have written this uh, let me go back here all these books and many more and you have written them uh, uh, more or less beyond the age of retirement for most people. Where do you get your energy and, uh, and uh, what keeps you going? <laughs> well, <clears throat> let me first say it's very daunting to be sitting here within a few meters of the Niels Abel building and to think of Sophus Lee and Sulo, because they are the great names in my field. And very early on, I was introduced to the brilliant yet tragic history of Niels Abel. And he's commemorated now in the Abel Prize. And it's just a very special privilege to be back here once more. I suppose the answer to that, Svera, and thank you so much for inviting me and those who've organized this. The wonderful thing about being an emeritus professor, emeritus is a Latin word that means very old. Um, <clears throat> at Oxford is that you can think about anything you really like. And that's what I do. But since I was a boy, I was fascinated by the three famous questions of Immanuel Kant. What can I know? What can I hope for? And what must I do? And of course, what can I know, principally for me, started with an interest in languages, ancient languages, Latin and Greek. And I was fascinated by knowledge coming from literature, but very rapidly, I got into science and in particular, mathematics. So one of the big questions that I have been interested in all my life is the question of the limits of science. Does it have limits? Many people think it doesn't. What is its status? 
And do we need to look elsewhere for information about two major things? First of all, the universe, and how it works, and what it is, and what, if any, it is its purpose, and also the status of human life. What is the significance of a human being? And that, of course, in an advanced technological age, is a more urgent problem than anywhere. But what keeps me going is a wife who <laughs> <coughs> prepares me wonderful meals and makes sure that I work for, for, well, many hours a day. I'll not tell you how many. And I have the luxury of virtually not traveling. This is one of the very few conferences I'm attending. And it's because I have such a marvelous experience of this country. And I'm utterly delighted to see three of my old friends from years back sitting here, come all the way from Olison and up there to attend this. So it's very special. And uh, I just will keep going because I think, to make the final points fairer, I've noticed during life that the interest in these big questions has increased. And uh, one of them, of course, is the identity and meaning question. Mm. Mm. So... That's why I do what I do. Yeah, thank you. And, and so those big questions, that's what brings us to the topic of the uh, 2084 book as well. Yes. So uh, I'm going to sort of zoom in on that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so you use uh, first some definitions so that, so that we are sort of in, in common ground here. So you use the uh, terminology narrow artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. And it's particularly the last one, which is what interests us here. But you need to, can, can you please uh, just explain them uh, a little bit, talk, say something about them, the challenges, the opportunities? Well, artificial intelligence becomes more difficult as you try to define it, like most big concepts. What do we mean by intelligence? And the famous... George Romanes, who has lent his name to the most prestigious annual lecture in Oxford, which was given this year by Professor Geoffrey Hinton on artificial intelligence. He said intelligence is the capacity to do the right thing at the right time. That was 1882, and it's a fascinating definition once you try and sort it out. Artificial comes, as you know, from two Latin words, ars, which means human skill, and facere to make. So it's something that's made by human skill. It's not real intelligence, it is artificial intelligence. And there are two kinds. And, uh, to summarize it briefly, at the heart of AI, uh, of the kind that's working at the moment, which is narrow AI, there are mathematical constructs that approximate certain aspects of the real world, its systems. And AI is capable of recognizing patterns, making predictions, analyzing outcomes, and making decisions, all of which would normally require human intelligence. And AI has been briefly defined as the theory and the development of computer systems that perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. Sometimes the term is applied to the machines themselves. So it has got a wide spectrum of definition. And we are familiar with the power of narrow AI, and with the development of chat GPT-4, and the brilliant use to which uh, the versions have been used to develop vaccines and to solve uh, hitherto thought utterly impossible questions, uh, particularly the how proteins fold, mm. which was a major it's triumph. It's really impressive. Yeah? Absolutely spectacular. Mm. Nobody thought it could be done. These are things that the existing machinery of narrow AI is doing. You don't have to speculate because AGI, artificial general intelligence, as the name implies, is the dream on the part of some people, the nightmare on the part of other people, of constructing a system that can do everything that human intelligence can do, and even more. So we're now talking about the quest for a superintelligence. And there are two 
strands in the research. The first is to take existing human beings and enhance them uh, by biological engineering, cyborg engineering, ultimately, possibly, as some people believe, merging humans with machines. Or the alternative view is held by people who think that biology is the problem because of the rapid degeneration and death of biological material. They want to start with non-biological material, like silicon, and build up to something that can either uh, have our contents of our intelligences uploaded to it. And, of course, that is the realm where science fiction really gets going. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the book, really, to try to balance a view of what's good and what's speculative and also the huge ethical problems that have already been raised by the AI that's being used at the moment. Yeah, so, even the narrow AI. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, narrow AI is, is creating many of the troubles that face us. Uh, I list one or two of them. But let me say that I'm not a Luddite. I don't hate technology. I'm using technology all the time. And I'm using human physical enhancement at the moment because what you don't know is that these glasses are reading your minds and they're feeding all your thoughts into them. And there's a processor enabling me to say something that you really like to hear. <laughs> you don't believe that for a moment, but, do you? Uh, but so so I, I propose to you maybe the title should be The Threat of AI, but, so, so, but you didn't like that title. <laughs> No, because I think it pushes it all to one side. Mm. Think, let, let's take a couple of really good examples. A medical AI system, pattern recognition uh, using closed circuit TV, facial recognition, can pick out a criminal in a crowd. That's very useful for a p police force. But let me put it this way. I think all technology is like a knife, a sharp knife. You can use it for surgery, and you can use it for murder. So at the same time as the police force, I suspect in Oslo, certainly in London, is picking out criminals in a football crowd using facial recognition, there is horrific suppression of a minority in Xinjiang and China using exactly the same technology to imprison millions of people mm. in a sophisticated, deep surveillance uh, state, which is terrifying. And that is a real threat mm. because it mm. will not remain confined to those countries. Mm. And uh, the problem is, it's like the knife. If you have got evil intentions, you can use it to destroy people if you've got good intentions. But in medicine, for example, a simple AI system these days would have a database of, say, a million pictures of lungs. They'd be labeled by the top experts in your um, Rick's hospital here as to all the diseases that they represent. And then a photograph is taken of my lungs. And the system compares the million pictures very rapidly with the picture of my lungs, and it spits out a diagnosis, which in general would be quite a lot more accurate than your local doctor or hospital will do. That's being rolled out in many different fields. Mm -hmm. And there's a different AI system for each thing because it needs to be emphasized that a narrow AI system can only do one thing normally, mm -hmm. not two or three, although they're putting these things together as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very good example, but think of the other side. Job losses to AI reckon to be at least 400 million in the next four years, possibly. The problem is AI is being used for job recruiting and has been shown often to exhibit bias. It's against women, it's against people of uh, color. It's being used with your permission to harvest information through every purchase you make on Amazon or any of these websites. And that information is being sold on to third parties without your permission. And uh, we accept it. I, I've, I've got a tracker that I'm wearing voluntarily so that people know where I am, what I'm saying, and all the rest of it. And that raises one of the deepest ethical problems. And it's this. 
how much privacy are you going to give up for the freedom to use this technology and for what will be promised to you in terms of surveillance. So you've got surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing is in this election year, 2024, over half the world will go to democratic elections. And the five eyes, uh, those are the security services of Australia, New Zealand, uh, UK, USA, and Canada, I've met recently, and they're saying that deep fakes are going to have a profound effect on um, the elections. The manipulation of people's ideas is very close to it at the moment. And it can be scary. Just last week, a deep fake was produced of me as an advert for a conversation on AI that I'm holding in London. But it was so convincing. It showed me denying certain things that I hold to be true. It was so convincing, they had to remake it and introduce all kinds of spoiler alerts. Mm. So this is seriously impressive technology. And those are the kind of things. Yeah, very good. So, so I'd like to um, move closer to general AI. And um, uh, it's, it's a result of better algorithms. It's a, be it's a result of better hardware, more computer power. And uh, we, I think we are sort of uh, tend to think that more computer power, faster, better, more accurate may maybe even, um, is the same as intelligence. And maybe even the same as us and yes. our consciousness. So, but uh, I think you distinguish, uh, many people, including you, will distinguish between that kind of intelligence and our kind of consciousness and intelligence. Yes, uh, and it's not just me that does that. Uh, the much more serious point is made by the pioneers. Um, there's, a, there's a writer whom I find quite interesting called Ian Bogost, and he says this, in science fiction, the promise or threat of AI is tied to humans' relationship to conscious machines. And in the fiction, machines warrant the name AI when they become sentient, or at least self-aware enough to act with expertise, not to mention volition and surprise. And what he says is, but in most cases, the systems making claims to AI are not sentient, are not self-aware, they're just software. Now, this is actually very important, so I'm going to read it to you accurately. Uh, there's a, a kind of AI Bible. Uh, it's <clears throat> Artificial Intelligence, a, a Modern Approach by Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig, who are both uh, pioneers in this field. And this is what they say. We are interested in creating programs that behave intelligently. The additional project of making them conscious is not one that we are equipped to take on, nor one whose success we would be able to determine. And they look back to Alan Turing, and I've been reading Turing's papers. Uh, they're very interesting looking back. He was a genius, an absolute genius. And he admitted there was a mystery about consciousness. But he did not think that it was necessary to solve the mystery of consciousness in order to construct an AI system. Because what he said was this, what matters is competence, the capacity to solve a prescribed task, whatever the task is. The machine may not be conscious in the same way as we are, but it's programmed to respond cognitively in the way that we do. In short, it does not think like a human being. It acts like a human being. And that's where you get the name of the film about Turing called The Imitation Game. Mm. And this is hugely important. One of the pioneers of AI, an elderly man that I met once in America, wrote a wonderful paper in the very early days of this. And the title of the paper goes like this. Listen carefully. The artificial in artificial intelligence is real. Have you got that? Mm -hmm. The word artificial in the phrase artificial intelligence is real. So artificial intelligence is not real intelligence. 
It is made by human beings. But what it does, it simulates human intelligence. And Norvik and others don't even try. Why they don't try is obvious, because no one knows what consciousness is. Mm -hmm. After all the years of study, uh, there is very little knowledge of what consciousness is. And that uh, raises a whole lot of questions, because, and this is be the final point here, AI is algorithmic, at its heart are algorithms, very sophisticated algorithms. But they are all, they all are in the realm of computability. So if something is not computable, it cannot even be simulated by an AI. Mm. Now this is where the interesting philosophical discussion comes. Because people like Sir Roger Penrose, the Nobel winning prize winner, uh, in Oxford, he says, there are certain things that the human mind can do. For example, Gödel's theorem, for those people who like mathematical logic, that a machine will never be able to do. That is, if you believe the church Turing thesis, that any computer, past, present, or future, can be simulated by a Turing machine. In other words, there is a limit. And so that seems to me... And I find those arguments pretty convincing, but there are other arguments that we're nowhere near. The idea of a conscious machine is science fiction, certainly at the moment, and probably will forever remain so, but people aren't worried about that. What they want to do is to be able to, for the chatbot, to deceive you into thinking that you're talking to a real human being. Mm. And if it can do that, it's achieved its purpose. Mm. Because this brings us to... Maybe it's science fiction, but, but people talk about transhumanism, and you mentioned it as well. So um, and that always comes up, maybe not from the people working in the field, but the people who are sort of peripheral to the field, and the science fiction writers. But do, what's, what's your take on transhumanism in this context? Well, if you come for, from Oxford, as I do, you can't avoid transhumanism, because the Oxford Future of Humanity Institute has one of the world's leading um, the transhumanist proponents, Nick Bostrom, uh, who's a Swedish professor, but he's been in Oxford for quite a long time. And it's a serious business because he defines it to be the intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and the desirability of fundamentally improving uh, the human condition by eliminating aging through technology, and greatly enhancing human intellectual and psychological and physical capacities. So this is taken seriously by many academics and by many entrepreneurs, because the amount of money being poured into this institute is staggering. It's not millions, it's billions, hmm. because people want to live forever. And you re we all resonate with that, don't we? Life is such a precious thing. Uh, and we're getting near to a number of huge philosophical questions that you cannot avoid, because this is a very ancient concept. So that is transhumanism, and one of the main proponents of it is not a scientist at all. It's Yuval Noah Harari, the author of a book with a, a very revealing title, Homo Deus, He's an Israeli historian, and this book has been a world uh, uh, bestseller. Mm, mm. Yeah, and uh, I, I was going to move into him because, into his topic, because he says now humankind is poised to replace natural selection with intelligent design and to extend life from the orga organic realm into the inorganic. So, in, uh, on reading your book, you seem to agree with him on some topics, and, and then you're highly critical of some of his other views, so, so that would be interesting if you could go into that. Well, I'm very flattered, Sverry, that you've read my book so carefully <laughs> uh, uh, to come to that conclusion, because you're exactly right. And I agree with him on very little, but that <laughs> okay. little is very... I noticed that. But that <laughs> little is very important. It's his warnings. Mm -hmm. And his warnings are, in a way, prescient. 
Let me give you an example of his warnings. Once big data systems know me better than I know myself, authority will shift from humans to algorithms. Big data could then empower big brother. So he sees a power problem, a control problem. And if you put alongside that the fact that many of the leading uh, researchers in artificial intelligence called a short time back for a moratorium. Stop research. Why? Because we don't actually understand what's happening in these systems. And we're afraid we're not going to be able to regulate them or control them. Now, there's a great deal of cynical reaction to that. And people say, it's okay for you big companies to say impose a moratorium because you're not going to stop your research and you're the ones that are making billions out of doing this research. But there does seem to be a real problem, which perhaps is indicated by the fact that Jeffrey Hinton, who was in Google and is called the godfather of AI, whatever that means, but you see, some people are thinking that AI will replace God, and we may come to that later, and they think it seriously. Mm. He uh, stepped out of Google so that he could speak freely because he is really concerned, and he's the one that gave this big lecture uh, in Oxford. One of the problems here, it's not Harari, a historian, who's saying this. You can easily write this off as science fiction. It's some of our leading scientists like uh, <clears throat> our astronomer Royal, uh, one of the brightest uh, astrophysicists and astronomers in the world at Cambridge. And he says, Martin Rees, Martin, Rees, Martin yeah. Rees, he says, you know, uh, humans will essentially merge with machines, and the difference between the entities of the future will be so great between then and now that they'll only have a vague, what he calls an algorithmic memory of what once was. Now that's a pretty extreme position, but here's a leading scientist saying this. And that of course fuels uh, the, the speculation. So warning number two is artificial intelligence, and this is coming up to the deep fakes, could erase many practical advantages of democracy and erode the ideals of liberty and equality. That is Yuval Harari. Mm. And he makes this interesting statement. The conflict between democracy and dictatorship is actually a conflict between two data processing systems. AI may swing the advantage towards the latter, that is towards totalitarianism. And we've already seen that's beginning to happen. So, I agree with Harari uh, on those kind of things, but where I find him very unconvincing is in the main thesis of Homodeus. Mm, mm, the Deus. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, no, more precisely what he thinks is going to happen. Yeah. Now, you quoted the fact that he's going to replace uh, natural selection by intelligent design, mm. which is a nice little comment. And we're going to take charge of the future, but to make it more precise, and I think perhaps more interesting uh, for you here, he has two main agenda items for the 21st century. One is the solution to what he calls the technical problem of physical death. It's a technical problem in his view, a medical problem. We're going to solve it so that you may die, but you won't have to die. Secondly, the next agenda item for the 21st century is to use enhanced technology, cyborg engineering, all kinds of different things, biogenetic engineering, to enhance human pleasure, the hedonistic imperative. Mm. And those two big things, he says, should drive the agenda in the 21st century. Mm. And I find that inconvincing, unconvincing. Mm. Mm. Now, your book, compared to very many books in AI, um, most AI books will look to the future, but you also have a take where you look to the past for an example of transhumanism. And that's, I think that's unique for your book. <laughs> and uh, 
Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, that's where I take the risk, you see. Yeah. But and now we take the risk here in the library. Yeah, we library. take the risk, but that's all right. These are intelligent people. Um, what, what fascinated me was, I wonder where you think the word transhuman comes from. I thought that it came from uh, Huxley. In 1957, he talked about transhumanism as being a desirable thing. But it doesn't. It comes a hundred years earlier than that from a translation from, uh, <clears throat> of Dante's book, Paradiso, into English. And the quote is this, words cannot speak of that transhuman change. Now, what Dante is talking about is his hope of resurrection from the dead. So maybe you could place Dante in time here for those who are not familiar with him. Well, could I? When was Dante? Who tell us? 1300s? Or? Yes, certainly in the Middle Ages. Yeah. So you've got, but the transhuman word only came in in the 1840s. In the translation. Yeah. The word was used in the translation, but not in the original. That's important. But it, it predates Huxley by 100 years. But the point is, he's talking about a Christian concept of resurrection. Now, in order not to spend a long time over this, uh, it's best to cut to the quick. So, in answer to Sveta's question, when people come to me, as they often do these days, and they tell me about the wonders of what transhumanism is going to do, uh, and going to conquer physical death, and all this kind of thing, and give us life, essentially immortal life, um, I say to them, you're too late. And they look at me very puzzled, and they say, we can't be too late, we haven't got there yet. I said, no, you're too late, you're completely too late. Because actually, there's evidence, and I believe it's stronger than the evidence that you're going to reach your point, that 20 centuries ago, the problem of physical death was solved when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead in Jerusalem. And not only that, simultaneously, his message was a message that answers all the transhumanist longings you could ever wish for. And when I discovered that, I was utterly fascinated. Here, in an ancient book that often is regarded as mythological today, is, to my mind, a profound analysis of the answer to the human longing for life. Now, Harari called his book Homo Deus, the man who is God. The idea of humans becoming God is very ancient. If some of you have ever read the third page of the Bible, you'll have come across it. And it was suggested first by a pretty diabolical snake, and so shouldn't, uh, should be taken pretty seriously. Because the suggestion was that God was suppressing human beings, and he didn't want to re them to reach that kind of transhuman level, now using this language. Now that is fascinating because that is one of the very widespread views of God in our culture today, which is why many people in Oxford, as well as I suspect here, just reject God out of hand. But actually it's a lie because what Christ came to say, if you'll allow me and I say to people, look, it's better to listen to what the message says before you reject it. Christ not only was raised from the dead, if the gospel records are true, and I believe they are for many reasons, but he promised to those who followed him that he would effect a transhuman change on them and raise them from the dead. And that answers all the hopes of the transhumanists. But it does it in such a way as to solve the problem that no transhumanist that I know of even takes account of, and that is human evil. Hmm. Paradise will never be built, as we've seen, from the attempts to create a new man, because they're not new, you know. In Nazi Germany, there were attempts using eugenics to create a super race of Aryans. In Soviet Russia, 
Trotsky in 1923, I believe it was, proposed the making scientifically of a new man, and he called that new man a superman. The result, hundreds of millions of people died. And I listened to a lecture recently in Oxford by one of the most interesting cultural commentators on polymaths alive on the planet today, Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who does research on the brain, which incidentally rather shatters the dream of transhumanism, but that's perhaps a question for later. And he quoted Solzhenitsyn. He said, when I was younger, I heard a speech by Alexander Solzhenitsyn when he was banned from Russia, and so did I. I remember it very well. And Solzhenitsyn said, if I am asked why a hundred million or more of my fellow citizens perished, I answer in four words, men have forgotten God. Mm. And this McGilchrist, who's not a Christian, not even a theist, lecturing on psychology of the human brain, neurology of the human brain, argues that his research in the brain shows us that we have so misunderstood the nature of reality and concentrated on the left side of our brains that we are left in a world, I quote, where we understand how almost everything works and we know the meaning of nothing. <laughs> and he says we have to recover that. Mm. Now, these are big issues, but it seems to me absolutely fantastic that people will listen to the futuristic scenarios of physicists like Max Tegmark, who's brilliant. His book, Life 3.0, is fascinating. And I want to say simply in my book, if you're going to listen to those futuristic scenarios, I would like you to think as well of an ancient scenario hmm. that promises not only the same thing, but something much better because it deals with la condition humaine. It deals with the human condition. And uh, so that is roughly speaking the answer yeah, yeah, to your very good. question. Uh -huh. I, I, I mean, you, you refer to the Bible indirectly now, and you do that a lot in your talks and your books. And um, I, I, I like to sort of, on the other side, uh, and on the other side, you have like Stephen Weinberg, uh, Stephen Hawking, Richard Dawkins, and many others who talk about a conflict between uh, science and that kind of transhumanism that we started with and, and the transhumanism that you present from the Bible now. But how do you combine rational mathematics and science with, this, uh, with belief in, in God and in Christ uh, like that? Well, very easily, because... I just ask myself, where did modern science come from? And study the history of it, agreed on by the leading historians of science. And Alfred North Whitehead put it together very well, but Alfred North Whitehead is not the easiest philosopher to read. So I'm going to give you C.S. Lewis's summary, and he is easy to read. He said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. You see, you look at the meteoric rise of science in the 16th and 17th centuries, starting with Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and then coming up Clark, Maxwell, Faraday, and all the rest of them, all believers in God. And historians and philosophers of science have seen there's a deep connection. And I want to say, your question, Svera, and I came across this as a teenager, and I'm so thankful I met a chemist in Cambridge, who pointed, I didn't know these facts of history. And it changed everything for me, mm. because I could regard my interest in science almost as a gift from God uh, ever after it. So, you know, Newton, who was pretty bright, he didn't find that his belief in God threatened uh, or hindered his science. It was the very motor that did it. And that is because he understood as very few Scientists these days understand that science actually is powerful because it's limited. Yeah, and that brings me to my, my, my final question. <laughs> oh, that's a mercy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because <coughs> this brings us to, to your second book, is sort of the secondary book here. But, but it's very hard for scientists actually to admit that science has limits. And I just came upon this uh, uh, Philip Ball, who's a British popular science writer and very prolific one, 
who, who write a book on biology, which we're not going to touch on here, but he also has a very subtle way of stating the limits of science. He says, the popular view that science is the process of studying what the world is like needs to be given an important qualification. Science tends to be the study of what we can study. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that statement. That's brilliant. Yeah, so, and you are among the few scientists who actually have written a book about uh, can science explain everything, the limits of science. Most scientists would write a book about all the wonderful things we can do and which will come in the future. So, so uh, <coughs> what is the main message? Let's end with that. What is the main message of that book, uh, of your book here? Well, science is powerful, and it's powerful precisely because it's narrow. The Nobel Prize winner, Eddington, once said that science asks questions, and the questions are like a fishing net. They're of a certain mesh size, and if, for example, your mesh is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, it won't catch a fish that's six centimeters long. But it would be very silly to deduce from the fact that you never caught a fish six centimeters long in that net that fish six centimeters long didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And he used this as a parable that all sciences, and science is a plural word, there are many disciplines, physics, chemistry, and so on, they have a net, they have a grid, they don't catch everything. Now, where did I learn that from? I learned it from a brilliant scientist who wrote a book called The Limits of Science, a Nobel Prize winner who worked in Oxford, Sir Peter Medawar, and rather ironically, he's the one thing I share with Richard Dawkins, because... Uh, he, uh, uh, Dawkins and I, think he's quite a hero. Uh, Sir Peter Medawar wrote Not the this... the only thing you agree with Dawkins on? <laughs> yeah, well, no, he, he agreed with me that there's such a thing as objective truth, and that's Yeah, that's, important. that's very important, yeah. But anyway, Sir Peter Medawar wrote, it's very, I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me, it's very easy to see that science has its limits. It cannot even answer the simple questions of a child. Where do I go, come from? Where am I going? And what is the meaning of my life? And he added, you have to go to literature, philosophy, and I would add theology to answer those questions. Now, I find that an increasing number of really great scientists, and I talk to them, agree with him these days. That, look, scientism permeates the academy, and it's the view that science tells us the whole truth. But that's not true in this university. Unless I'm uh, wrong, does this university have a faculty of history? It does. It does. Mm -hmm. Does it have a faculty of economics mm -hmm. and languages? At least institutes, yes. Yes, yeah, so mm -hmm. it doesn't believe that science is the only way to truth if it's teaching literature, does it? If science were the only way to teach uh, to get to the truth, you'd have to close half your faculties in every university tomorrow. That's just foolish thinking. And actually, it is totally illogical thinking. I hope you like logic at this time of the afternoon, do you? <laughs> well, think of this statement. Science is the only way to truth. Is that a statement of science? No. It's a statement about science. So if it's true, it's false. So the statement, science is the only way to truth, is logically incoherent. End of story. Alas, for people that don't really understand logic. And it's hugely important. Science is powerful. It gives us certain aspects of the truth. But rarely, even within science itself, does it tell us everything. For example, I used to think at school, that Newton's law of gravitation told me what gravity was. I then discovered that Newton himself didn't know what it was. Mm. You see, even in its own reference, scientific explanations are rarely uh, comprehensive. My final point on this, which uh, forms a very important part of my book, is to try to explain to people by simple analogies to grasp this point that the whole thing circles the question of what do you mean by an explanation? Here's the kettle. It's around the corner there, I think, now. 
Why is the water boiling? Well, because they heat energy. Uh, electrical coils and heat energy is agitating the molecules of water and it's boiling. That's why it's boiling. Actually, it isn't. It's boiling because I'm desperate for a cup of tea. Now, think of those two explanations. One is in terms of heat physics. The other is in terms of personal agency, my desire for a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me, do those explanations conflict? No. Do they contradict each other? No. They complement each other, and you need both of them for a full explanation, don't mm -hmm. you? I wish scientists, many of whom I talk to, who cannot see the difference. There are different kinds of explanation. Let me put it very bluntly to you. The scientific explanation of the universe, or explanations, no more conflicts with the God explanation than the explanation for a car engine in terms of automobile engineering conflicts with Henry Ford. There are different kinds of explanation. And I think a lot of the heat would be taken out of this. And it amazed me that the late Stephen Hawking, who was a genius, I remember him very well at Cambridge, said to people, you've got to choose between science and God. Mm -hmm. Because he thought, as I discovered after a lot of work on his writing, that for him... The science explanation is an alternative to the God explanation because it's the same kind of explanation, so the one excludes the other. But that's nonsense, absolute nonsense. You might as well say that Henry Ford competes with automobile engineering or physics. So that is the main message. And what I feel is this. We've made a mistake in certain areas of thinking that the natural sciences are coextensive with rationality. They're not. History is a rational discipline. So is archaeology, so is linguistics, languages, philosophy. They're rational disciplines, but they're not the natural sciences. And we need the whole thing. Mm. And that, if I had a lot of time, would bring me back to Ian McGilchrist and his analysis of this, which is just brilliant. And this impacts, of course, on the prospects of artificial intelligence, the general intelligence. <laughs> it it so all has impact. comment on that to, to it, it, it's, it's, Let me put it this way. What McGilchrist has done uh, through very hard neuro neurological research, he's just written a book that some of my colleagues have told me is the most important book that's been written in the last 250 years. It weighs a ton, a metric ton. <laughs> it's, it's got two... Is it 200 pages of references? It's two heavy volumes. And it's called The Matter with Things. Our brains are delusions and the unmaking of the Western world, something like that. It is absolutely fascinating, but it's much cheaper in Kindle, I tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. This has been very interesting, and thanks uh, for... Uh, Presenting your views there, so let's let's give him a hand. Yeah. <laughs> We're open for some questions, and uh, I have to see if I can uh, figure yeah, out this uh, this uh, questioning system now, um, and uh, hopefully that I go there. I think. By the way, while he's looking for that, I am ashamed. Here I am, I don't know how many hundred people are here. Your language is Norwegian. And you sit patiently and you listen to me in English. I ought to be ashamed of myself, you know. <laughs> but I congratulate you all because Norway was one of those countries where the English is flawless. And a number of you, I would encourage to come to Britain and teach us how to speak. <laughs> <coughs> There is an interesting question here, upvoted. Do you believe the singularity will happen at some point? Which singularity? <laughs> I well, mean, Ray cap Kurtz Capital S. Yes, well, I know. I, I have been. Ray Kurzweil uh, has got this idea of a singularity. And it used to amuse me because it's been around for a long time. And it's always about 50 years ahead of the present. 
And it seems to have remained there for quite a long time. It, it keeps moving. And I, I think one of the definitions of it, nobody's sure what it means, but it's the merging of humans with machines or the takeover of humans by machinery and all this kind of thing. I'm not a prophet. I think we're going to do a lot of things and possibly a lot of dangerous things because there is a philosophy around in some parts of the world. If you can do it, you should do it. And there are no ethical controls and restraints. Now, this is bringing us actually to a topic that we barely touched, the question of regulating AI. How do you regulate it? And that's hugely problematic. Mm. Uh, Vladimir Putin said some years ago, he said, whatever state or person controls AI will control the world. And there's a huge race between Russia, China, the US, and India to do that and probably Europe as well. And there's some evidence of that. But whether the singularity will occur in the form of a radical redesign of human beings, it could happen in the sense that I've been very influenced through my life by the late C.S. Lewis, and I'm old enough to have remembered listening to him at Cambridge. I went to his last lectures. And Anybody interested in this field should read two books. One is a short book written in 1940 called The Abolition of Man. And the other is the final volume of his science fiction series, That Hideous Strength. Mm. And what he said was, talking about engineering humans, and it's fascinating, especially in the science fiction book, how near he got to the kind of idea that is being spread today, totalitarian takeover of the world, all this kind of stuff. But in the earlier book, he said, what we need to think about is this idea of bioengineering in the germline. Now, I'm not talking about little implants in your brain that might help you to see a bit more and all this kind of thing. What I'm talking about is a group of scientists who would be located in an institute somewhere on planet Earth who will re-specify and reprogram the human genetic germline so that all people descended from that group will be programmed forever and locked in to whatever those scientists specify. And it brings us back to one of my first statements, artificial intelligence, artifact. And Lewis says, they won't be human. They'll be artifacts. And then he's got this chilling statement. He said, the final triumph of humanity will be the abolition of man. Mm. That's what I fear. Mm. Mm. Because there could be a singularity of that type where an irreversible change is made by scientists reprogramming human beings fundamentally. Now, all kinds of exciting things are going on. Just this week... There is hope of developing ChatGPT4 so that it will enable human beings to converse with whales because it will understand and resolve the language that whales are using. Now, that, of course, would be very interesting to find out what whales thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we might not like it, my you, but hmm. that's one thing. But this is an entirely different thing. And that's where I am concerned at this people often call it playing God. This is a somewhat oh, sorry, yes. different question. Right? Okay, right. Um, does it really matter if AI is actually intelligent, in quotes? A plane does not fly like a bird, but we still say that it flies, and it makes the same use to us as if it actually had flapped its wings. Well, if you take that view, that's fine, but that's exactly the view of Norvig and, and the others, and that is that the important thing is what it does, not what it thinks. It's mm. not thinking at all. A plane is not thinking at all. It has got no consciousness, and it has no conscience or anything like that. It's not a moral being. Mm. And if you take that view, that's fine. But to say it doesn't matter, I think, is a completely different thing because that's a moral statement. And that is saying, does it matter? Well, it does if whatever entity you create or machinery you create begins to threaten 
and provide an existential risk to the human race. Mm. Now, those two words I haven't used yet, but they are seriously under consideration. The existential risk to humanity of our failing to control the machines we're making. And I have asked some of the leaders recently, I, I said, look, what are we not being told? Uh, I asked a man who's done leading research in, in the United States, and he said, well, I think we're not being told a lot, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> There's something going on out there, because you don't get, what is it, 2,000, 5,000 people signing something without there being some nervous stuff behind it. Now, mm. I wouldn't want to exaggerate it, but we don't know. And <clears throat> Stephen Hawking, you remember what he said? He, he said, uh, the problem with AI will, in the end, be competence that it will outperform all humans, uh, and therefore uh, a rogue AI may regard the human race as unnecessary. It might even keep a few human beings around as pets, or it might destroy the whole lot. Now, I have views on this, mm. and, well, I'd perhaps state them, but we'll go yeah. to the next one. Yeah. Here's an interesting question, which has been upvoted a lot. Do you see any parallels between the development of AI and the building of the Tower of Babel. Oh, yes. <laughs> Just written a book about it. <laughs> I, I've always been fascinated by the Tower of Babel and all the symbolism of it. Because, of course, like Homo Deus, it's man reaching for God, and it's an attempt to create a unity based on a common language. Now, that is nowadays the drive behind AI's abolition of language differences. I expect you've noticed that, that this is a huge drive. It won't be long before I have a little machine, and I can speak just like this, and if you're a Chinese audience, it'll come out as, as Mandarin. Mm. And that's very close at the moment. And uh, many of us have used ChatGPT to translate books and all this kind of thing. So that is... People are arguing for this because the world is divided by languages. And that is what happened, according to the biblical story. It was a judgment of God and people wanting to make a name for themselves, which is the exact phrase used, by ignoring God and building up to heaven. It's the theory of the skyscraper, which I've studied in some detail. It's, it's very interesting. Behind every skyscraper they tell me, lies an even bigger ego. And uh, it's a very interesting philosophy behind these things. But if I, you don't mind me advertising it, my book has just come out. It's called Friend of God, Abraham. Uh, the story of Abraham in an age of doubt. And I've spent a lot of time researching the background to Babel because that philosophy is all around us. And what is so interesting about it is this. They were technologically advanced. There's nothing wrong with that. It was their dismissal of God. And Abram was called out from that region. And God said to him, leave there and I will make your name great. It's not wrong to have ambition, to have significance. And here's the meaning question. But there are two ways of finding it. One is to try and create it myself by scrambling over other people and pushing them out of the way if I need to or destroying them. And the other is through a relationship with God where I accept the significance that he gives me. And that's been the key to my life, so I'm happy to be able to say that. And the most upvoted question of all, and I think we're going to end with that, is uh, on the same topic. What good reasons do you have for believing in the dogma of the resurrection? That's the transhumanism. I'm very I'm interested to, to describe that. it as a dogma. Because that's a heavily loaded word, as some of you will realize. I used to think it was related to dogs, but it isn't. Um, <laughs> the idea is that it is based on no evidence. Mm. It's simply, that's it. But that's not it for me at all. I, I believe that Christ rose from the dead because I think there's very powerful evidence for it. 
And I'm afraid I've written a book about that as well. <laughs> so if you want to know... After, what, after retirement age for normal people? No, 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 <laughs> long before. It's called Gunning for God. Because one of the big problems here is that many people say, look, you're a scientist. Don't be silly. They resurrection of Jesus is a non-starter because it contradicts our knowledge of the laws of nature. Because David Hume, a Scottish Enlightenment philosopher whom you've all heard of, very famous, famously wrote that miracles are violations of the laws of nature and therefore they can't occur. And he recognizes it would be a miracle, he said, if someone rose from the dead because he does... So that's impossible. I don't think so. I think Hume was wrong. And I can prove it very easily. Uh, just think, I'm staying in a hotel. Now, this would never happen in Norway, but I'm staying in a hotel here. So, on the first night, I put 100 crowns in my drawer, right? Beside my bed. The second night, I put 200. How many are there in the drawer? Oh, you can't work that out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> second night, I put another 100. Now, the third morning, I get up, and I'm going home, and I open the drawer, and there are 50 crowns in there. Now, what do I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken, or the laws of Norway? <laughs> what? The laws of Norway. How do I know that? Because the laws of arithmetic have not been broken. You see, Hume was talking nonsense, actually. The laws of nature are our descriptions of what normally happens. If I hold that, Newton's law of gravity will say, if I drop it, it will fall towards the center of the earth. That won't stop Sphera catching it. Something can come in from outside and intervene because it's not a closed system. And the mistake that Hume made, and the mistake I made when I put the crowns in my drawer, was to think that the drawer, the room, was a closed system of cause and effect, which is what many people who espouse the philosophy of materialism believe today in the academy. But it's not. So that when God raised Jesus from the dead, this didn't break any laws of nature. In fact, we only recognize it as a supernatural event because we know the laws of nature. If you didn't know the dead bodies didn't normally stay in graves, you wouldn't be the least bit concerned if somebody popped up out of a grave, would you? It's because we know the regularities. And with this approach, what, um, what um, uh, the Scottish philosopher Hume thought was that you had an in-principle argument from science against miracle. That falls. And I have many more reasons for saying that. Uh, the second thing is that leaves open an investigation, a critical investigation, as to whether the evidence for this particular claim stands up. Now, that would take me a very long time, but I've done it. And you'll find me, unfortunately, all over the internet and quite a few talks on the evidence for the resurrection. Mm. I think we'll leave it there. So uh, thank you for uh, answering these questions as well. So final big time. Thank you very much. I, I, I think our questioner deserves a special round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you.